You are listening to Skinai Jerusalem Calling. I'm your host, Anna Balser. Today we have as our guest Mika Kurtz, who was born and raised in Jerusalem. At 19, he joined the Israeli Defense Forces as a combat soldier and attained the rank of Master Sergeant. After an honorable discharge from the Army, he co-founded Breaking the Silence, an organization of former Israeli soldiers speaking out about our service in the occupied territories at the moral price, the degradation of spirit we have had to pay on both societal and personal levels while serving our nation, end quote. He has met with grassroots activists around the world and learned the importance and the effectiveness of local community organizing. Traveling in and out of the occupied territories, he has begun mapping the vast grassroots social justice and environmental sustainability efforts in and around Jerusalem. He believes that grassroots efforts are ultimately linked. He, he plans to weave a common vision with the communities working on these urgent issues. Micha, welcome today. Thank you. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm great. Tell us a little bit, Micha, about why you founded Breaking the Silence. Breaking the Silence, I founded with a couple of friends after our Army service. During our Army service, uh, most of it, or a lot of it, was in a town called uh, Hebron, a settlement of 600 people, Jewish settlers, kind of right smack in the middle of, of a 160,000 Palestinian town. So imagine a, a big city, and right in the middle there's a, there's a group of a few hundred fanatics who decide to take over that part of town, and we were there to protect them. What we found ourselves doing eventually, we were protecting Palestinians from the settlers. And we noticed that there was a reality happening around us that not many people in Israel really knew about or still don't really know about or are willing to accept. And we had decided to speak up. We decided people need to know what's going on and understand the reality at the checkpoints. I don't know how many people understand what a, what a checkpoint actually means or how many really exist. Standing at a checkpoint as a soldier... You get loads of control. You get, to, you get to tell people what to do. You get to, as an 18-year-old kid, control hundreds of lives daily. This is a normal reality for hundreds of thousands of Palestinians who live in the, the occupied territory. We decided that people, people need to know what's going on, and we decided to break the silence. It's very interesting to me to hear the way that Israelis, with things just 10 miles away, don't necessarily know exactly what's going on. And I recently read that a study on international freedom of press um, released uh, Tuesday, actually, the results were recently released. Um, it placed Israel 93rd out of 175, meaning that since last year, it has dropped 44 spots. Interestingly, Lebanon actually ranked 32 places ahead of Israel. So I think a lot of times we might overestimate the amount of freedom of press within Israel and, the, and how much Israelis actually know what's going on. And just yesterday, Micha and I learned, we'd spoken at Brown University just two nights ago, we learned that an article covering our visit to Brown in which we talked about the occupation of Palestine, that an article written by a local journalist was censored from the Providence Phoenix because it was deemed too unbalanced. And I said, well, it's true, there was an Israeli and a Jew speaking. Perhaps there should have been a Palestinian voice represented, but I have a feeling that's not exactly what they meant. Uh, do you have any comments? Yeah, this is a common reality in Israel. It's kind of funny to watch the papers. Uh, as a soldier, we, we would do one thing during the night, and we got our orders, arrested someone, or, or conquered it, and went into a new village. The next days in the newspaper, there would be a completely different story. I learned while I was in the Army to not trust uh, mainstream media, <laughs> not in Israel and, and, and not in the States either. Certainly not in the United States. Having done what you, what you do, what has your relationship become like with perhaps your friends in Israel, especially those that might be serving in the army? What do most soldiers that you know think about what you do? That, that depends on how much a person is willing to be open to reality around and admit. It's a long process of disillusionment, and it's not easy for most Israelis to come to terms with what's actually going on in the occupied territories. My friends in Breaking the Silence sometimes have a hard time in Israeli society. The last report that came out before the Goldstone report had come out was a Breaking the Silence report on Gaza and what was going on. They had collected, I think, about 35 testimonies from soldiers who had served in the Gaza Strip in January during the attack from different units. They were talking about all the different human rights violations that were going on in Israeli society. This requires them to be very brave, I must say. 
it's not simple to step up and speak the truth. It's very heartwarming to see how many Israelis are doing that. Recently, a group of Israeli high school students chose not to join the army and faced possible jail time. We heard yesterday, actually, that Ezra Nawi, an Israeli member of Ta'ayush, an organization devoted to uh, working together to end the occupation of Palestine, he was sentenced to 30 days in prison after being convicted of assaulting border guard officers rioting during the demolition of illegal Bedouin structures, or so-called illegal Bedouin structures near South Mount Hebron. Do you know Ezra? Can you tell us a little bit about who he is and what this imprisonment represents? You are listening to CNI Jerusalem Calling. I'm your host, Anna Walter. We're speaking with Misha Kortz, co founder of Breaking the Silence and founder of Grassroots Jerusalem. Mika, I just asked you about Ezra Nawi, an Israeli activist who was recently sent- sentenced to a month in prison, and, and what that really represents. Uh, to you, and maybe a little bit about him, too. I've known Ezra for a long time. Believe it or not, Jerusalem's a pretty small town. And Ezra, by trade, is a plumber. He was uh, my mother's plumber as I was growing up. Ezra's an inspiration to many, many people in and around Jerusalem. Uh, lately, what we've been dealing with in Jerusalem is the olive harvest. And a lot of what the many people have been doing, Israelis and international volunteers, have been helping out with the Palestinian olive harvest, which has been quite a challenge because of lack of access to the land. The reality of the wall is something that we haven't talked about. There's a big wall that stands right between many, many families and the land that they work, that they've worked for generations. So Ezra has always been around helping for years and years now within Palestinian families. And as he's been there, there's a large group of activists that have grown around him. And he, for years, has been an inspiration. It's tough to know that a a man as sweet as Ezra, who is, by the way, of Iraqi descent, is being thrown to prison for something that we know couldn't be true because I know him. I've known him for years. He's a very, very gentle man. This this comes as a shock. Is it a shock? I mean, is this the first time something like this uh, has happened? No, it's not the first time something like this has happened. Uh, They try to make an example out of activists like Ezra, Yesterday we were talking about the raids on the new profile office and the way this represented a real crackdown on Israelis' conscientious objectors um, trying to not be a part of what Israel's doing. Yeah, new profile is an organization that works to demilitarize Israeli society. Since right now I don't know how many people understand that everyone in Israel goes to the army. Men go for three years and women go for two years. And I was brought up from a very young age knowing and looking forward to, to serving in the IDF, New Profile works to create a civil society that's actually healthy and not based on this military service. And they help young Israelis through the process of uh, what it takes to not go to the army and sometimes uh, refuse and go to prison and what are the legalities around that. And the raids that happened a few months ago was a big hit because New Profile promises these young Israelis that they will not share their information with anyone. This is all confidential. These raids in the middle of the night, grabbing laptops and grabbing lots of information from people's private homes, meant that all this information was passed on and is no longer secret. The number of, of refused nicks dropped, sadly, after that. It really represents the threat that this poses, really, to the Israeli system, that once you have more and more Israelis speaking out, it is just one more part of bringing down the system of oppression of Palestinians. So there are a lot of Israelis speaking out. Having been uh, recently in Jerusalem, do you feel that more and more Israelis are coming to share similar views to ours, or do you feel an opposite trend happening in in mainstream Israeli society? I feel both. I think we're polarizing. There are many Israelis that are understanding and realizing what's happening around them. But at the same time, the media and the police and the army are doing their best to break up demonstrations, uh, even peaceful demonstrations. This summer, demonstrating outside of uh, the Jawad family in uh, the neighborhood of Sheikh Jarrah in East Jerusalem that had been evicted at four in the morning from their homes only to have it reoccupied an hour later at five in the morning by a new family of settlers. We had organized many different demonstrations, and, and, and one of them, I remember, which was a silent candle vigil led by Rabbi Arik Asherman from Rabbis for Human Rights, they managed to break up a demonstration as peaceful as that by simply violently arresting Arik and throwing him into an army jeep. These crackdowns are, are becoming more and more. By the way, this was the same week that Mike Huckabee, 
congressman, if I'm not mistaken, from Arkansas showed up in East Jerusalem to inaugurate a new settlement again in the middle of a Palestinian neighborhood and cut the ribbon for that. When many Israelis are questioned, why go to Americans and talk about our dirty laundry? I think this answers the question. There are politicians from the states that are very much involved with what's going on there, not to mention the funding, $30 billion that have promised from the states over the next 10 years just for military aid. It's that people need to understand that it's, while we, we might appreciate uh, in Israel the support we get from the states, I don't appreciate it when it's solely meant for M-16s, grenade launchers, RPGs, new airplanes, and security barriers that don't really work that way. Given the role that we definitely do play here in the United States, what do you recommend to Americans? What do you think are effective ways that people in the United States, given our role, could actually influence uh, what's happening in well, Palestine? To begin with, I think what's, what's gaining more and more momentum, and I'm very much inspired by it, is the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. Since most Israelis in Tel Aviv or in Afula or even in West Jerusalem don't really feel the effects of the occupation, uh, daily life is, is normal. It's like um, San Francisco in Tel Aviv. And I think as long as it doesn't affect daily life in Israel, it's not going to change. And I think the BDS movement is one of the things that can change life in Israel. And, and it's going to change anyway. I think that's something that Israelis are going to have to come to terms with. Uh, what's going on today is not sustainable and cannot last. And so we can either come to terms with it earlier and mend the situation, or it'll have to happen by people around the world saying this is going to stop, the same way apartheid ended in, in South Africa years ago. I myself also am so inspired by the boycott, divestment, sanctions movement. I recently spoke at Hampshire College, which uh, recently became the first U.S. college to divest from the Israeli occupation. It was also a few decades ago the first U.S. college to divest from apartheid South Africa. And to me, one of the biggest symbols of the way that this movement is really very effective is the response it has from uh, from Zionist groups here in the United States as well as Israel. I mean, looking at the Israeli newspapers, the way there's growing concern about this, if not hysteria at times, and the way that Zionist groups here in the United States, including APAC, have really focused their efforts on, on countering this campaign, which there are now too many of us uh, working on it. So, so I myself am also inspired by that. If anyone out there listening is interested in the BDS campaign, there's a great website, BDS Movement. Net, and this was a call made by Palestinian civil society for people around the world to join with the Palestinians to support them by stopping profiting off of the occupation and the oppression of Palestinians. It's a very inspiring movement. I'd like to ask Misa a little bit more about another campaign that he's a part of that I think you very much believe in in terms of how Americans can play a role in changing the situation, and that is, of course, the organization that you recently founded, grassroots Jerusalem. Besides the BDS movement, I think, and, and divesting from what's going on policy level in Israel, I think it's important to realize that on the ground daily there are activists and normal regular people that are very much involved in many, many different organizations in and around Jerusalem and all over the occupied territories that work tirelessly to find solutions to urgent issues that politicians just don't even address or ignore or simply create. Uh, these people work on water catchment systems. They, they're the ones who demonstrate. They're the ones who... These are Israelis and Palestinians and internationals who do work together, who do know each other. You are listening to CNI Jerusalem College. I'm your host, Anna Balser. We're speaking with Misa Kurtz, co-founder of Breaking the Silence and founder of Grassroots Jerusalem. And Misa, we were just talking about this new organization, Grassroots Jerusalem. You were telling us a bit about the different organizations happening on the ground, and we'd love to hear more about them as well as the mission of Grassroots Jerusalem itself. This work comes out of frustration about our lingo. We're used to arguing on large political levels, Israel and Palestine and left-wing and right-wing and one-state solution and two-state solution, and growing up and living in Jerusalem, you notice that daily reality actually doesn't have much to do with those large questions. It has to do with what's going on on the ground in East Jerusalem. What happens during a curfew or what a house demolition looks like? Many people don't know that thousands and thousands of houses have been demolished. You know, to describe what that means to a family, I've, I've met with families who've had their house demolished twice. There are houses that have been demolished four times. The reason, by the way, for that is a fairly simple one. 
Jerusalem, supposedly a very modern city. In 1967, after the Six-Day War, the east side of Jerusalem had been annexed to Jerusalem on the west side, meaning it is not officially part of the occupied territories. This means that East Jerusalem is under municipal responsibility. So when you walk around West Jerusalem, it kind of feels, again, like San Francisco. There are community gardens. It's green. There are playgrounds for children and schools, just like an everyday town in the States. But when you cross the street, literally cross the street into the east side of Jerusalem, it feels as if you walk into a third world country. The municipality in Jerusalem does not, almost by policy, take care of East Jerusalem. There are no infrastructure plans. There's sewage in the streets. There aren't enough schools. So children are taking turns going to school. I'm referring to the reality on the ground as opposed to our, our political lingo that we're, that we're so used to. And a lot of what we're doing in grassroots Jerusalem is letting people know what does an occupation actually look like, or what does Jerusalem look like today? Well, while so many people around the world mention Jerusalem in their prayers weekly, uh, maybe it's time we found out what Jerusalem looks like today. I work today with many different grassroots organizations who understand the urgent needs on the ground, and who understand that if there's a village, say, for example, Beit Sechul, which is a five-minute drive outside of Jerusalem, uh, right underneath the city of Bethlehem. Beit Sechul this summer has had their water shut off for 40 days. I don't know how, you, how if, if people can realize what that means, 40 days without water. There are grassroots organizations that, as well as demonstrate, find ways to set up water catchment systems, find innovative ways to to create long-term solutions that would work in Besachul just for that. This is just one example of many. There, there are organizations like the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions that document and report on all the different demolitions. The reason this many house demolitions is because the Jerusalem municipality simply doesn't have infrastructure plans to provide East Jerusalem residents with. So when the time comes to build a new home for a new family, there is nowhere to compare the architecture plans at the municipality, so there's no way to get a permit. And so when a home is built without a permit, it is simply demolished. The crude and cruel reality of it is, is it, it usually happens at four in the morning so as not to create too much havoc and not to have it in front of TV cameras. So with an army escort, a bulldozer would come at four in the morning, evict the family within an hour's notice, and demolish the home. This is reality. This is daily reality. This isn't something that happens every once and again. Without ICAD, uh, we wouldn't know about this. Besides that, just the lingo and things that politicians know about. I think these grassroots organizations do set the tone eventually for political lingo. I, I have good friends who have taken Tony Blair or other politicians to places they would never have seen. The Jalin school that was just built of tires in a Bedouin village that didn't have a school and didn't have the infrastructure. And, and children have to be escorted to school because they run into settlers daily on the way had built a, a new school, the first of its kind in the area, built of mud and tires. The politicians would never know about this, and this would never make the papers, and I or, or people around here wouldn't know about it. If a good friend of mine wouldn't have taken Tony Blair by the hand and, and showed it to him. I believe we have a caller, Brian, from Canada. I hope it'll stay with what you're kind of talking about, but I just want to switch it just a little bit. I was reading an article by Shomo Sand. Have you heard of him? Yes, he's, uh, he's an historian, if I'm not mistaken. Well, correct. And yeah, he was in, I believe he was in New York, at a, at a, a university here in the, in the United States anyway, and he was before a crowd. And this is what the statement that he made. He says the Palestinians are a thousand times more likely to be the Jews or the ancestors of the Jews from the Bible than the Israelis, the Jews that are in Palestine today. I was just thinking... If that statement is true, and this guy is a, is, a, is a Jewish person, if he can make that statement, how does the Ashkenazis feel about when they're there napalming them, dropping 2,000-pound bombs on their heads, killing them? How do they feel about that, killing the true Jews of Palestine? As you know, Ben Gurion in 1948, when he was in there cleaning out the Palestinians, he even made the statement that the Palestinians are probably ancestors of the Jews of the Bible also. There have been many different historians, not just fans, there are many different historians that are coming out with very interesting theories. Beyond all that, these allegations must be confusing. To describe the reality in Jerusalem and Israel or Palestine is difficult. To describe the urgency 
for which that people live their lives from today to today. Very little talk about the future, very little vision about what five years down the line looks like. I think on many levels, both on political levels and, and on the ground. So when it comes to people talking about the Palestinians being the original Jews, when you take a minute to read about that, it's very interesting and might as well be true. But at the same time, sadly, it doesn't affect the reality immediately on the ground. I hope it opens doors to possibility of thinking, imagining what can actually happen if this occupation ended and we started accepting one another and looking into each other's eyes as opposed to just seeing a person and labeling them as Palestinian or Israeli. That's most frustrating for me. If I could add in to, to the response to that question, I, too, um, have, have heard a lot about these genetic reports that claim or, or show that Sephardic Jews, let's say, have more in common with the Palestinians genetically than either population does with Ashkenazi Jews, indicating that Palestinians are very much the descendants of the peoples that were living you know, in the land of Canaan thousands of years ago. And I know these have been disputed. The non-geneticist, it's hard for me to decipher through this debate. I think we should remember that whoever is the direct descendant of people there 2,000 years ago, even more, thousands and thousands of years ago, does not tell us who has rights there today. The people who are living there today, the people who have lived there for generations, have rights, whether or not their ancestors were there thousands of years ago. That goes for Palestinians and Israelis. But it does make this idea of Jewish return to the area a little bit absurd when an Ashkenazi Jew like me can return and yet the 7.2 million Palestinian refugees cannot. I believe we have a question on the line. We have Carl from Queens. The Palestinians are Mormons, Jews, Muslims, or Christians is not important. The important thing is that they're being occupied and atrocities are being committed against them. All the goodwill that the Jews have produced over the years, and, and I'm convinced that the life expectancy, we're living 10 years longer, just to, to, we got the Jews to thank in medicine and all the generosity to science and everything all over the world. It is quickly evaporating with each passing year because of the atrocities they're committing on the Palestinian people. You don't have to be a genius to, to understand right is right and wrong is wrong. And that's all I have to say. Thank you, dear. Thank you, Carl. Yes, Micha, what, what does it mean to, to Judaism and to the Jewish people, what's happening today in Palestine? I can say what it means to me as a proud Jew. I feel it's my responsibility to be part of the human rights movement, especially for what, uh, what's going on today in, in the occupied territories. I, I think we need to notice the differences between uh, what it means to be Zionist and what it means to be Israeli and what it means to be Jewish. I've heard you speak of this many times. I'm a proud Jew, and I'm proud to live in Jerusalem, and I'm proud to be working for human rights and for Palestinian rights in the area I grew up in. And I think Carl's right. There's a lot of cry out about anti-Semitism these years, and, and I think we can tell the difference between what it means to hate Jews and what it means right now to not accept what Israeli policies are today. And I don't accept Israeli policies and what the Israeli government is leading in the occupied territory. It's surreal to me when I'm living in Palestine to see these jeeps and these soldiers and these uh, fighter jets all bearing the Star of David, of course, the representation now of the State of Israel, but this is, a, this is an ancient symbol of the Jewish people. And what this really says to Palestinians and to the world, and what is explicitly said by Israel, is that what Israel does and who Israel is represents the Jewish people. And, and as a Jewish person, I reject this idea that, that Israel speaks for me and that what Israel does has anything to do with Judaism and the Jewish people. I mean, obviously there are Jews committing these crimes, but, but that occupation and oppression, these things have, have nothing to do with Judaism. And likewise, I tell this to audiences, I speak to non-Jewish audiences, what Israel does is not Judaism, so is speaking out against human rights violations, not anti-Jewish. That's an absurd claim that it's anti-Semitic. I think a lot of what I see in the state when I meet with Jewish communities around the state is for a very, very long time, the Jewish identity meant very, very simply that you were pro-Israel. Is it good for Israel or not? Uh, this, this was always the Friday night dinner question. Is it good for Israel? And this, this defined the identity of many Jews across this country. I'm watching this process of disillusionment, and I can only say that, I, that I've partaken in it, of realizing that actually Israel does not represent the Jewish values, and this is, this is a very difficult process for many Jews that I've met. 
over the years, the, many of the settlements had been funded by Jewish communities. There are a lot of what's going on in Israel, of, but of course, is supported by Jewish communities around the world. Today, realizing what this has led to is, is also realizing that it's time to set our priorities straight and realize what's going on and what we can actually be investing in. A lot of the settlements today, do people realize how powerful settlers are and how many millions of dollars they have at their fingertips to set up a, a new settlement just freely? Ariel, for example, a settlement in the Shomron, in the West Bank. Mm -hmm. Nablus area. In the Nablus area. It's actually not as much funded by Jews these days as it is funded by evangelical Christians from the Bible Belt. I've heard an interview with the mayor expressing how proud he was that the community center, the, the strip malls, the swimming pools, uh, these are all funded by evangelical communities. The power that the, the settlers have, as opposed to them, well, there's a growing community of grassroots activists who work tirelessly daily to find solutions to these local issues, work on the lowest budgets you can imagine. We're scraping money for buses to go replant olive trees that are constantly being uprooted or burnt. I think this is a ridiculous situation. Going back to the BDS movement and what people can do here in the States, we can realize that there actually is a level of reality there that we can invest in. We can say this is something we want to support. These people are the foundation of the potential civil society that's being created in Jerusalem now. Of course, the first priority right now is to end the occupation. We all know today that the occupation must end. I'm hoping that the Americans can help us create the space to think towards what the day after the occupation is going to look like. And that's going to be when the world decides that that's a priority. As someone who spends a lot of time thinking about the one-state solution and two-state solution, and we, we very much focus on, on these very abstract ideas. When people ask me about Palestinians and Israelis working together, Palestinians and Jews living together and, 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 and working together, this is not a, a novel idea. First of all, uh, historically, Jews lived very well within the Arab world, better, by the way, than anywhere in the Christian and Western world. So we know historically... Um, that, that there's no sort of inherent inability for people to, to live together. What Grassroots Jerusalem addresses, is it humanitarian needs or is it also the sort of political need creating the circumstances where Palestinians and Israelis can work together as equals, which of course is, is impossible right now. See, the grassroots organizations deal with a variety of different issues and there are organizations that deal with politics and there are organizations that deal with human rights issues and human needs on the ground. They deal with water, they deal with food. They deal with access to schools. They deal with infrastructure and planning. And, as I said earlier, um, uh, the policies on political levels. What we're seeing is a community of Israelis and Palestinians and internationals that come and volunteer from all over the world that are a basis for what we're talking about. If anyone in the States is looking to find out more about it, simply log on to grassrootsjerusalem.org. This is the beginning of a website that reflects what is going on daily on the ground from all the different corners and all the different issues. These are really organizations that I think are in need of support and fund. The fact that settlers have, are, are able to really do whatever they want, and yet uh, these grassroots organizations can hardly keep up day, day by day. I think a lot of Americans don't know how they can help, how they can support the Palestinian people. And one way for Palestinians who are working on these projects of permaculture, of trying to, to create a new reality, to, de to defy the occupation, not to deny that it exists, to deny yes. that they don't have equal rights. But, but uh, supporting grassroots Jerusalem seems to me um, one of many ways, along with boycott, divestment, sanctions, that we can support uh, the movement for, for a just peace uh, in the Middle East, meant for, for a just peace uh, in the Middle East, meant for, 